Hello everyone, my name is Phuc and today I'm going to talk about a complete urinalysis. So urinalysis is made up from urine and analysis. A complete urinalysis is made up from three tests. The first one being the visual exam, um, so which is used to generally investigate the appearance of the urine by observation. The second is a dipstick exam which consists of some quantitative and semi-quantitative tests and whose results is observed by watching the change of the colors on the band of the dipstick. And the last one is microscopic exam. So in this exam, the urine sediment sample will be investigated under a microscope to uh, look for any ab abnormal components. So the first test of a complex urinalysis we're going to talk about is the visual exam. So the visual exam is where you have to use your observation to see if there is any abnormality in your urine sample. So there, there are often three features that you have to look at when you examine a urine sample is that that is color, clarity and form in the urine. So uh, about the color, urine can come in a variety of color. So in most often the shades of yellow, from very pale yellow to dark yellow or even amber. It depends on how diluted the urine is and how much fluid the patient drinks. Uh, unusual or abnormal color in the, of the urine may be the result of a disease process or it just some contaminants like medications. Like multivitamins can turn your urine into bright yellow or the result of any certain food that can make your urine change its color. For example, some people can have red color urine by eating beets or rhubarb or berries. Uh, and carrots can turn your urine into a light orange. But however, red color urine can also occur when blood is present in the urine. And it can be an indicator or suggestion there is some, some position in the renal system that has injuries. Um, another example is that the yellow, brown, or greenish urine is maybe a sign of the bilirubin present in the urine. The clarity of the urine is refers to how clear the urine is. So usually, laboratories report the clarity of the urine using uh, four terms. For uh, four terms here, the first one is the clearest urine is clear. Uh, the next one is uh, slightly cloudy, cloudy, and the most cloudy one is turbid. It's called turbid. So the normal urine can be clear or sometimes cloudy, uh, and it is cloudy because sometimes substances like uh, sperm, prostatic fluid, or um, cells from the skin, normal crystal, normal urine crystal, or contaminants like lotions or powder can make your urine um, cloudy. Those uh, contaminants are not, contain are not uh, considered as unhealthy. But other substances that can make your urine cloudy like red blood cells, white blood cells, pus, or bacteria don't indicate a pathological condition that require medical attention. And the last one is foam in the urine is also a sign to be noticed. It could be because of the patient bladder is so full that the water, the flow of urine hitting the toilet is fast enough to stir up the water and cause foam. But sometimes the urine is too concentrated in the case of dehydration can also cause a foam in the urine. Uh, one more cause is the retrograde ejaculation. I think you have heard of, have heard of this term before, uh, which is a condition that happened when in men, when the semen backs up into the bladder and not coming out the of the penis, uh, it can make the urine foamy because of the semen. Pathological conditions may include proteinuria, where too much protein is leaked through the filtration uh, through the filtration membrane of the bowel and capsules. Uh, it can be due to the excessive protein uh, and consumption, nephrotic syndrome, infections, etc. Uh, it can be due to lycosuria, where the concentration of glucose is higher than normal, which can be 
observed in the Fanconi syndrome or the diabetes mellitus, which is very common now. So the next one we're going to talk about is the dipstick test. So the test is considered as one of the most common tests now here in uh, Vietnam medical centers because of its uh, convenience. convenience. Um, and it's very easy to conduct. To conduct, it's quick and it comes in low price. So the dipstick used in the test is a thin strip with 10 parameters, uh, 10 qualitative or semi-qualitative parameters. The test is interpreted by observing the change of the colors on the strip. So here are the 10 parameters on the stick. So the first parameters I want to talk about is the blood. And the test can not only detect blood in the urine, but can also detect the uh, appearance of uh, myoglobin or hemoglobin because these substances can also turn the urine red. So the sensitivity of a test is over 80% and it is more sensitive to myoglobin or hemoglobin to the whole red blood cells. So that's why when the strip is exposed to myoglobin or hemoglobin, the whole strip will turn green and when it only exposed to the whole red blood cell, only green scatter dots will present on the bed. And every positive result of this te test is abnormal and can suggest damages in the renal structure, the lupus nephritis tumors, urinary tract infections, acute tubular necrosis, or traumatized uh, catheterization. Uh, but there are also very high chance that you may have false positive or false negative result as this is only uh, the semi-quantitative uh, or qualitative or qualitative test. So uh, false positive results appear when you have the contamination from the blood during menstruation, uh, you have semen in the urine or in uh, or you collect urine after you exercise or in the case of dehydration. And the false negative appear when the patient has had captopril or other angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors before or vitamin C or if you leave the sample exposed to the air for too long and basically any oxygenating, oxygenating substances can you know contaminate can make uh, can create a false negative result for test. So the second parameter I want to talk about is the glucose. So uh, there are 180 grams of glucose being reabsorbed by the renal tubules a day. Hence, um, in the normal urine, there won't be any glucose. But when the amount of glucose exceeds this uh, number, glucose will present in the urine. So the normal values for the test is negative for the MSU because you know uh, in the MSU the amount of the urine in the sample is very small and the test cannot detect any glucose in the sample but for the 24 hour urine uh, the amount of glucose is norm normally uh, you know smaller than 0.3 grams per day a positive result suggests uh, conditions like diabetes mellitus, viral gland disorder, acromegaly, uh, decrease in glucose reabsorption in Fanconi, Fanconi uh, syndrome, or uh, pregnancy. Literally any condition that raises the level of the gluco gluconeogenesis hormone in the plasma. So the next parameter I want to talk about is the ketone. So uh, the ketone is produced by uh, from fat metabolism and is not normally found in the urine. So uh, if the ketone is present in the urine, that means that there are some um, there are some issues going on that require medical attention. So a positive result of the ketone suggests some conditions like the diabetes mellitus, uh, fasting. Uh, persistent vomiting which can lead to acidosis, hyperthyroidism or fever. Uh, false negative of the ketone, uh, like I've mentioned before, also appear when you leave the sample out in the air for too long which can allow the evaporation of ketone happen and decrease the level of ketone in the urine sample. 
so the next parameter is uh, nitrite nitrite uh, salt is not normally found in the urine so this test is an indirect way to detect the gram negative bacteria in your urine because uh, you know the gram negative bacteria in the urine convert the nitrate salt into nitrite and this nitrite can be detected by the dipstick specifically so uh so of course a positive result of this test can suggest an uh, uti urinary tract infection condition so but it also can cause false positive results when the sample is not stored properly especially when you leave it out in the air or room temperature which can allow the colonization of the bacteria to happen and these bacteria will in turn uh, convert these nit nitrates into the nitrite and these nitrites can cause a positive false positive result so uh, the next parameter I want to talk about is the leukocyte um, the dipstick test cannot detect the leukocyte in the form of whole cell but it can only detect the, uh, present, the, the presence of a leukocyte via a substance produced by the, the cells and that is leukocyte esterase but the problem is these esterases on, can only be produced by the granulocytes and is not produced by the lymphocytes so uh, a positive result of this test indicates a UTI condition and if the dipstick test reveals a positive result the, the urine sample will, should then be taken for a uh, microscopic examination to look for the leukocyte and the bacteria so uh, the sixth parameter I want to talk about is the bilirubin so the bilirubin is or called biosol is a byproduct of the uh, of the degradation process of red blood cells in uh, so it is produced in the liver and normally is created as biosol in by the kidney as urobilinogen the presence of bilirubin in the urine hence is abnormal so positive, uh, a positive result suggests conditions like hepatitis, cirrhosis, liver or bile duct cancer, bile duct stone or cholecholiasis or pancreatic tumor. But there are still chances for false negative result, like when you have a high amount of selenium in your plasma, or certain medications can also cause false negative or false positive results the next one is urobilinogen uh, less than one percent of urobilinogen is passed through the renal system and the remainder is excreted in the feces or transported back to the liver and converted into vial and therefore a small amount of urobilinogen can present in the urine so it can be considered normal if uh, there are urobilinogen in the urine and the normal value for the urobilinogen is uh, less than one milligram in the MSU for the MSU sample. It's considered negative, though. And in twenty-four hour urine is zero point five to four milligrams per day. And a positive result suggests biliary obstruction or uh, acidic, um, excessive hemolysis. Uh, and false positive happen when. Uh, there's a high amount of nitrite in the urine so the next one is the protein so as you know normally urine does not contain any protein because you know, the protein itself is very large in size and also weight so it cannot cross the, uh, the hole on the filtration membrane of the Bowman capsule and part, partly because of the size and because of the negative electric field so therefore the presence of the protein in the urine is abnormal so the dipstick test is more sensitive to albumin than other types of protein uh, so therefore negative results cannot exclude the presence of these other proteins so any positive result except for the traits because protein can still appear in the urine in a very small amount so suggests injuries in the urinary tract, inflammations, malignancies, or it is an early size of renal dysfunction. But uh, false positive 
can also appear when the urine is too alkaline or too concentrated and some sub substances like iodinated radio contract agents in imaging examination can also cause uh, false positive results and on the contrary false negative results appear when the urine is too acidic or uh, like I've mentioned or even or in the case when the protein uh, present in the urine is not albumin but other protein as well. The next one is the pH of the urine. So the dipstick measure the hydrogen ion concentration in the urine. So uh, the mechanism is a bit like the um, color indicator in the chemistry you've learned in high school. So it is important that a fresh sample be used of urine. Uh, so be used as urine becomes more alkaline over time as the bacteria in the air convert urea to ammonia and ammonia is very al alkaline so the urine is normally acidic but the normal pH can range from uh, 4.5 to 8 which is a very wide range so the acidic pH can be seen in uh, when the patient consumes so too much acidic food like berries or some other citrus or high protein diet or some physical activities mm, diabetes and the pathological conditions that makes the urine more acidic is uh, diabetes mellitus ketonuria acidosis diarrhea etc the alkali ph can be seen in cases like uh, when you consume too much veggies or vegetarian or low, uh, low carb diet and the uh, pathological conditions may include uh, alkalosis of course in, con in contrast to the acidosis case um, the renal calculi or in UTIs so the final parameter I want to mention is the specific gravity of the urine so the specific gravity signifies the concentration of uh, dissolved solids and it reflects the effectiveness of the radar tubule to concentrate it uh, in case when the body needs to reserve fluid. So if there were no solutes present, the, um, the specific gravity of the urine would be 1.000, 1 1.000. It's the same as pure water though. So the uh, specific gravity of the normal urine is around 1.010, but it can vary greatly. So the decreased uh, specific gravity, gravity may be due to excessive fluid intake uh, by oral or IV fluid, which can dilute your urine significantly, or in renal failure or acute glomerulus nephritis or diabetes diabetes and severus, these uh, pathological conditions can uh, dilute your urine very significantly. And increased specific gravity may be due to dehydration, due to pure fluid intake, vomiting, or diarrhea. Basically, any conditions that uh, decrease your whole body for fluid volume and in heart failure, inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion or called SIADH, uh, etc. And these pathological conditions can uh, will um, concentrate or will yeah will condense your urine. So it is uh, increase it will increase the specific gravity. So this is the end of um, the um, dipstick test. So we will move to the micro microscopic exam. So now we will talk about microscopic examination. So microscopic examination is very important, but usually in a clinical setting, it's usually overlooked. Now we will talk about uh, some uh, things about this examination. We will discuss about why it is overlooked. So first, I want to start with uh, collection and preparation. So about collection, it's very similar to that of uh, an example for the other part of the urine analysis but there's something that we need to uh, take in uh, about is that first thing is that it should be about 10 to 15 milliliters for it to get a good volume so that the centrifugation process can use uh, 10 uh, 
get us a good enough amount of sediments. The second thing that we need to uh, think about is that it should be uh, exam under two hours after collection because the stability of the urine sample is very important when we view the sample under a microscope because the crystal can form and the cast can deteriorate. The third thing is that in the other tests, you can throw the sample and then use it later for test. But for microscopic examination, you sh should not uh, refrigerate your samples because it can form crystal. Got about preparation, we will have three steps. First, we will do centrifugation for five minutes. Then we will discard the top part and leave about 0.2 to 0.5 milliliters. Shake and then we will view it under the microscope. So, what can we view under a sediment study? There are multiple things. We can have cells like red blood cells, white blood cells, or epithelial cells. It could be bacteria, it could be cast, it could be crystal, and it could be other things. So, we will talk about these things in detail now. The first thing I want to talk about is red blood cells. Red urine is the most common thing that would, uh, you would want to do a sedimentary diagnosis for because this process can help you in many things. It could help you diagnose, it could help you differentiate this from many other diseases. The centrifugation process itself already helps you differentiate between something called chromatic chromatic substances inside a urine from a true hematuria. So chromatic substances can be many things. It could be hemoglobin, it could be myoglobin, it could be rhapsome myoglobin, it could be coloring from foods like carrots, like beets, other stuff. So after a centrifugation process, you would have a tube and there will be three cases with the tube. First, it will be a unison liquid, a unison liquid without any sediments, and it will be red. In this case, the most likely thing that it would have would be a chromatic substance, like maybe the other thing I want to talk about, like um, hemoglobin from proximal hematuria, which is a genetic disease. It could be myoglobin from overexercise, and it could be coloring from foods like someone consumed too much meat. The second a uh, case that could happen is that we would have a tube that had some coloring in the liquid part and some sedimentary uh, red blood cells. This, this uh, foam, we would say that it's, it's most likely come from urinary glomerulus origin. So because there, these red blood cells already have to pass through the glomerular membrane, so it's already distorted and it's very weak. So when you do a centrifugation, some of them will burst. That's why you have some sedimentary cells and you will have a liquid with a red coloring. And the third thing could happen is that you have a clear liquid, but there is some sedimentary cells in the tube. And in this case, we will say that this is most likely come from non glomerulus origin, which which means it comes from a urinary tract, it comes from an infection or bleeding from somewhere in your gynal uh, urinary tract. So the next thing I will talk about is the diagnostic values uh, from viewing this, these red blood cells under a microscope. So when you have a slide, a slide and you view this microscope, uh, view it under a microscope, if the red blood cells come out whole and non-distorted, but usually you can see it as a very disc-like cells without a nucleus. These are usually red blood cells. And if they are whole, usually for most part, it comes from non glomerulus origin, which is the same thing. That is, it's usually an infection or bleeding or something. But if they have come out distorted, maybe it's not round, it's maybe like this or something like that. It's not really round anymore. Then you will say that it's most likely to come from glomerulus origin. So this is the most important thing that you would do when you have a red urine sample. So this is the most important part of this, this examination and it's usually 
very, very, very often used in clinical setting. The cutoff point for something called hematuria, this, which is this part of hematuria, which is blood within urine. So the cutoff point, there's so many cutoff points. So I want uh, all of you to uh, do some research and use your common sense to have an idea about hematuria because in uh, an English textbook that we usually use more than three on a high power view, which is a time 40 microscope lens. But this number in many Vietnamese textbooks will be five. So I want you to use common sense to think about what is really a hematuria process. Another one they would use, which is because this number is very dependent on the collection, very dependent on the technician that do this process. So they would use another one, which is which is they calculate by computer. When you put the sample through a, a shift, which is a more than 25 per microliters. So this, this will be more correct. But this number requires a specific machine. I don't think that this machine is available in Vietnam. So use it with, uh, with caution. So that's it about red blood cells. So we will move on about white blood cells. So the things about white blood cells in a sedimentary uh, study is that it's not really that specific. If a sample is positive for leucoesterase, uh, which is one of the or a substance that you will test for in the dipstick test, then it would be already calculate this this the presence of uh, white blood cells more specific than uh, the you see red, uh, white blood cells under the microscope because it depends enough. The same on like red blood cells, but it's dependent on so, so many things. It depends on the technician, the time, and the amount you con collect. So it's actually not a very widely, widely used number, but you use you will use it when you are not diagnosing, but more like when you are wanting to um, seeing how the progression of the disease or how the treatment affect your patient. And I think this will be a better tool to use than a dipstick. But for that not, diagnostic process, it's not really that more specific. It will be more than two for a high power field. So more than two is already enough. But for men, for men, for women, this will be about five. And again, I would use this number for very cautious, cautiously. And I would recommend you practice your clinical sense because I would not rely on this number to diagnose someone with urinary tract infection because it's not that more specific than a basic test. The fourth thing that you would want to consider about is so I mean, you know, cells, it doesn't have any diagnostic values, but it can tell you that whether or not this sample is viable because. If a sample has too many epithelial cells present, it's more likely that this, this sample is contaminated. What does it mean? What it means is that you have some sheddings of the, uh, the genitalia fall into your samples. And usually this means that your sample is not viable for diagnostic values. So usually we would not use this, uh, we would not seem to care about the presence of epithelial cells at all. The next thing, which is something that I want to talk in length about is the bacteria. So bacteria is a very fun thing that you could do when you have a sediment diagnostic study. So when you view a slide under a microscope, actually under only 40, and body lens, you already you can already see some bacteria. Most of them actually, some of them can be viewed without stains, like moth, moth and the road. Most of them will have a rough shape and very very easily seen under a microscope. Some more, some of the skeptical skeptical family can easily be seen. Some of the streptococcus family can also very easily seen under a microscope without stain. So, it is a viable tool for diagnosis. Actually, it has very high diagnostic value. If there are five on the high power view, it already equal to more than CFU, more than uh, 100,000 colony units, which is 
so high and it's already enough, more than enough to diagnose a UTI. So, however, again, this number is very dependent on the technician. And as a clinic, clinician, you should use common sense to view this number very carefully. But the thing I want to talk about this and why it's so important to me is that the viewing of bacteria in the uh, sediments can have another, another use. Have you ever heard about sterile? Something called sterile pyuria. So pyuria, which means a presence of pus in urine, uh, something uh, we'll already talk about in the first part is that the urine has pus in them. It appears cloudy. However, your when you view it under a microscope without stain, without stain or even stain, or and you do culture, you already do do culture do some culture of the bacteria, but it will be a negative. So now, we will call that uh, problem as sterile pyuria, which means there are pus, there are white blood cells, but you cannot find the presence of the bacteria. You cannot find, find it. So what now? So there's many things can cause a sterile pyuria. It could be actually sterile. So sterile pyuria, it could be really sterile, it could be a leakage from the lymphatic system. It could also be something more uh, something more serious, like some cancer, especially some blood cancer can show up as um, sterile pyuria, like leukemia, for example. However, most likely is that you have some very specific bacteria on your hand that not show up on a normal culture. In this case, which is almost very often happen in a clinical setting, which is STDs. Most STDs, sexually, sexually transmitted disease, most of the bacteria under the STDs uh, will not appear under a normal culture. Something like syphilis, gonorrhea, gonorrhea, Gonorrhea and chlamydia cannot show up on normal culture, so you should be very mindful about STD. But the thing about STD is that it could easily be viewed under stain, a normal stain, a normal stain, especially gonorrhea. It could be viewed as tiny red dots inside a white blood cells, or chlamydia, the same thing. So you should, when you are thinking about STD, you should do a sedimentary study with stain in mind. However, it could also be negative on stain. Then, this is not likely to happen, but you should think about tuberculosis too. Tuberculosis of the, the urinary tract can show up as a sterile pyuria, but under specific stain, in this case, a new Zeusen, right, an anti-acid uh, stain can show up. You can see some tuberculosis cells. Okay. So that about sterile pyuria, which is very often happen in a clinical setting and which is something that you should do when you have an STD or some UTIs on your hand. You should do a bacteria study when you do a uh, sedimentary examination. The next thing I want to talk about is crystals. The thing about crystals in a urine sample is that one, it doesn't have that much diagnostic value. Actually, I don't think that um, and many clinicians use crystals as a diagnostic tools at all. The thing is, crystal is very dependent on the how the urine is collected, the pH of the urine sample, and actually the pH of the urine sample is already have higher diagnostic value than crystal itself. So I don't know. However, in some cases, you can see that they, they are very useful and has very high suggested value. So the first thing I want to talk about and an example why crystal is such a bad, bad tool for diagnostics is the amorphosphorus crystal. They are a, what is it called, a coffin, we said coffin shape crystals. And this crystal usually happen under UTIs, especially in the uh, UTIs, usually for the uh, Proteus and the uh, Clepsinia family. These UTIs and these families will create this crystal, the amorphous phosphor crystal. 
However, usually we will not wait to see these crystal forms, diagnostics, and UTIs because these family has another very important uh, characteristic because they will form a high pH or high pH urine and they will be positive for nitrogen. So these two characteristic use for lipstick, the lipstick test is already enough for you to think about these 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 two. So actually nobody will use amorphosphora as a tool to diagnose UTIs for this family. However, you should know about it. The second thing is uric acid. The same thing, uric acid is some uh, crystal is very dependent on the pH of the uh, of the urine. And it's not usually have a high enough concentration to create the crystal that you can feel easily for some common disease like gout. But I want to talk about something very serious, which is tumor lysis. So in tumor lysis syndrome, because of the mass die-off of the cancer cells after treatment of chemotherapy, the mass die-off can cause a high influx of acid uric and it could create some crystal, sometimes a large amount of crystals. So in this case, I would think that it has some diagnostic value so I would say that you should remember about tumor lysis syndrome when you see some patient with some uh, acid, uric acid show up on their test. Another thing is you can see also like crystal. And the thing about all of the crystal is that it's not very commonly used in clinical setting. However, it could be very specific. For example, like the two next one, like can see also like and cysteine, cysteine crystal. These are specifically for two diseases. The first one is ethylene glycon intoxication, which is you ingest ethylene glycon. I don't think that many people ingest it. It's toxic, but you can you can see it. Another thing about it is cysteine crystal. Cysteine crystal is the same thing. It's a very specific genetic disease, but if they show up, then this is a uh, very high suggestive value for that genetic disease. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Can't touch this. Oh, oh, oh.